All right, we're going to begin our study now. We're in uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 6. There's a little graphic behind me to kind of illustrate what we're going to be talking about tonight again. This isn't anything new or anything you haven't seen before, but I'm a visual kind of a guy. I doodle even when I'm reading my Bible and I'm drawing things and just, you know, just to make, help myself get a grasp of things a little better. And I think that, uh, as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words sometimes, you know? And so it does help to kind of illustrate these things, I think. All right, so we're in Hebrews chapter 6. Let's just go ahead and read the verses that we're going to examine again tonight. I'll just start in verse number 9. Uh, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, we're not going to look at that tonight, but that'll probably be maybe next Wednesday's message. Through faith and patience inherit the promises. What do you, have, what do you need in order to inherit promises as a Christian? Faith. Just faith. But for someone, faith and patience. Patience is a part of, the, uh, part of what's required in order to have an inheritance with God. And faith and patience are found several times together in the book of Revelation, speaking about the salvation that the Hebrews, and not just the Hebrews, but all people during the tribulation, need both faith and patience in order to be saved, to inherit the promises. And we're not going to get on that tonight, but it's coming since it's a part of this verse. But we're still going to just finish, Lord willing, tonight, this expression here, verse 11. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. We talked about that last week, about the importance of diligence as a Christian. Now, this is not written to the church, it's written to the Hebrew people, Hebrew believers uh, of the early church age, but also the Hebrews that are going to be the direct focus of all of God's attention during the tribulation. All right? This book, Hebrews, is going to be for them like the Gospel of John is to you and I. All right? Probably if somebody is thinking about getting saved and you're wondering where they should begin reading or they ask you where they should begin reading, most likely we probably would direct them to the book of John if they're interested in knowing about salvation. Well, in the tribulation, the book of Hebrews is going to be is written specifically to prepare the Hebrew people for salvation in Jesus Christ because at the end of the tribulation, they're going to see Jesus Christ with their own eyes. He said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And it'll be a moment in the tribulation when the entire nation, all the Hebrews that have survived the tribulation, it won't be all of them will have made it, but uh, one third of them will have survived through that tribulation time, according to Zechariah. And those survivors will all together in one day an entire nation will be born again. That's what the Bible predicts in the book of Isaiah. So an incredible, it's a, it's a miracle when one soul gets saved here, right? It's, it, we, we thank the Lord for that. Anthony got saved last Wednesday night. We're rejoicing about that. Can you imagine an entire nation, a whole nation getting saved in one day? That's what Isaiah said is going to happen. They'll be born in a day. And so the book of Hebrews is getting them ready for that, teaching them things about Jesus Christ, that they should have learned as a people, as a nation, when they had their Messiah in their midst. But they missed it, misunderstood it, uh, their eyes were blinded, their hearts were hardened, they rejected Him, 
but it's not over for them. There's another, still another chance for them. God in his mercy is going to woo them to himself like someone courting a spouse, you know, and the Lord, the book of Hosea says the Lord is going to take them out into the wilderness in Hosea. He said he'll take them out into the wilderness and draw them to himself, win them, woo them to himself. He's going to win their hearts over to him again. It'll be, it'll be a tough time in the tribulation, a lot of persecution, as you know, some, someone told me recently that uh, we were talking about something, uh, we were reading the Bible together with our family and mentioned something in Revelation, turned over there. Somebody said, ah, I don't like read Revelation. That's too scary. And I know some Christians feel that way. It's just too scary. But that book, that book of Revelation, predicts the future of the nation of Israel and the future of your coming back to this earth to reign over the earth. And, but anyway, Hebrews, in my opinion, in addition to just being a blessing to us right now, a blessing to us during the church age, it also has a secondary purpose, and that is to get the Hebrew people ready for the greatest blessing that they'll ever receive as a nation when their eyes are opened and they're all born again in one day and Jesus Christ, uh, is, they see who he is and God the Father marries himself to Israel once again. That's, that's coming. And so, I don't know, reading Hebrews to me is kind of exciting because this is sort of the preparation for a big, big event. Uh, but anyway, so here we're looking at verse number 11. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence. So, as we apply this to you and me right now, and anything we do for the Lord, be diligent. Amen. Stick with it, right? You know, be, give it your whole heart, right? Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, right? Do it wholeheartedly. There's an awful lot of half-hearted Christians. There's an awful lot of Christians that just do things, you know, half-hearted. They do things halfway. Um, even God said about Israel that Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, was a cake half-turned. That's an interesting expression. We, we change that. Most of our common expressions come out of the Bible. A cake half turned, you know what that means, right? Half baked. You save somebody, they're half baked. That's, that was Israel. A cake half turned. And a lot of Christians are half baked, half hearted. You know, uh, I was going to say something else, but it wouldn't be nice. But um, just not whole hearted, not diligent. And I think the Savior deserves that. I think Jesus Christ deserves Amen. diligence on my part. Diligence. At least that. I might not be the greatest brain in the world or have as many gifts as somebody else, but you know, whatever I do have and whatever I can do, I can do with all my heart. You know, and that's all I can do. And that's all you can do. And if whatever you can do, you do it with your whole heart, the Lord expects nothing more. Just do it with your whole heart. And not with eye service as men pleasers, but as unto the Lord. That's diligence, and that's what we should do. So that's, this, and this is an admonition for you and me right now. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. In other words, with your heart, truly, why do I do it? Not for what I might receive now, but hope has to do with the future, right? Faith looks back to promises made, the cross, things that have, God has done in the past, right? or things that we've read that have been written in the past, right? That is faith, right? But hope looks ahead. Hope is forward-looking. Hope is, hope gets us through. Boy, when somebody has no, when they have lost hope, right? Hopeless, in other words. Most people, when they get in a situation like that, don't want to go on. They don't think that tomorrow holds anything for them. They don't think there's any reason to get up another day. That's what happens when people lose hope. Hope looks forward to tomorrow, the next day, next week, next year, next thousand years. My hope reaches millions of years into the future because I know whom I have believed. Amen. Right? And I know whom I have believed, and I understand the promises he's made. I know he's good. He cannot lie. And so... I, I, have, I, I have full assurance. My, I have full assurance of hope, right? I, I don't doubt one bit that God is able to perform what he's promised. I don't doubt that one bit. I never sit up at night worrying, you know, I wonder if that book is really true. I wonder if I've, you know, 
rolled the dice and bet on the wrong horse and the whatever. No, ain't no way. I know who I have I believed. I know what he's done in my life. I, kn I know this book is true. And so I'm not, I don't have full confidence in me. I got full confidence in him. <laughs> I don't have much confidence in myself because I'm, I'm a jerk. But my Savior has never hurt anybody and never failed. And his promises are true. And I've come to trust this book and to trust and love him. And when that's the case, you have hope for tomorrow. You, you have confidence, right, that... What he has said, he will perform, right? That's, that's hope, right? I can get up another day. Even if the circumstances in my life might be lousy, I have hope because God is not dead. He's not dead. His word is still true. He's still coming exactly like he said he was going to come, when he said he's going to come, and I don't have to worry about those things. And so what does that do for you? It helps you to be diligent. It helps you to be diligent, right? It helps our diligence if we have that full assurance of hope, right? So that applies to both Christians and the people to whom this book was written, the Hebrew people. All right, that applies to me and you. All right, and it also says that we might have that full assurance of hope, not just until tomorrow morning, but unto the end. All right, so what we've looked at the last couple of weeks has been those two words that are found in that verse. The word hope and the word end. And it's a great Bible study because it allows us to show the differences between and rightly divide the differences in the King James Bible. Because for the nation of Israel and for the New Testament church, there are two different ends and two different hopes. All right? For you and I, we, last Wednesday night, we talked about our end. The end for us would be, wait, let me point this in the right direction. Here we go. All right. We're in this period right here. This is the church age. Obviously, it's not to scale. That's 2,000 years from the time of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, the church age began. He formed the church himself. And, uh, and we have been in this church dispensation ever since that time. And since that time, since Jesus died on the cross, since there was a perfect sacrifice made, and we now have a perfect high priest, then salvation is different now than it was here or any other time in the past. It's obviously different because prior to Calvary, there was no perfect sacrifice for sin. The Lamb of God had not been slain. The blood had not been shed. The Old Testament, there's this old economy, this old system of priests, temple, sacraments, sacrifices, feast days, holy days, all this kind of stuff. What happened? And Jesus Christ, when He came along, He nailed all of that to the cross. It's, fil it's fulfilled. It's done. It's over. And so we don't need any priests any longer. We don't need any sacred place to gather. I mean, we thank God for a place to gather here, but there's nothing sacred about this building. I mean, it's special to us. It's sanctified, but it doesn't make it sacred. It's just brick and mortar. It's just carpet, and it's going to burn. So, but, but since the cross, our salvation is all spiritual. The kingdom of God is within us, all right? And you enter into that kingdom, into the kingdom of God, or I should say the kingdom of God enters into us when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So that all began right here, right? Before the cross, over here, all you've got is religion. Even the Hebrew religion. It's just religion. Jesus Christ himself, even in the Sermon on the Mount, called it the Jews' religion. He was a Jew. He called it the Jews' religion. Because why? He was just about to put an end to it. Yeah. Right? He was going to put an end to it. Right? For Christ is the end of the law, sure. for righteousness' sake. Yeah. Right? He ended it. Yeah. He ended it. So it all stopped right here. What, what's, what's here? Just faith. Faith in Jesus Christ. A book in your hand. Learn about Him. Love Him. Try to live for Him. Try to do something that would make other people want to know Him. That's it. Not a list of rules and regulations. Not 
authoritarian like control over your life. It's we, we live and walk in the Spirit, right? With the Holy Spirit guiding us, the Holy Spirit equipping us, enabling us, the Holy Spirit opening our eyes so we can understand His Word. That's, that's the Christian life now, right? It's very simple, really. It's very simple. And, but it comes to an end. Right here, it comes to an end. This is when we get out of here. Amen. How close are we? I don't know. Pretty close. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Could be tomorrow. Could be tonight. We don't know. We're not sure. I don't know. But the Lord only promised us 2,000 years. And I don't know, any, just about any way you count from the cross, we're about 2,000 years. So we're coming to the end of this church age. Our end. The end of the church. The conclusion of the church age. Boy, it ends gloriously. It ends beautifully for a child of God. It ends with you and I being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So when the Bible, when Paul speaks about the end, he's not talking about the end of the world. He's not talking, because there's another kind of an end over here. But these two things are very different. This period right here would be the tribulation. The time after the rapture, when the Antichrist is on the earth. We believe, and I think can pretty well support, that it's only a short period of time, three and a half years. Uh, not seven as is normally taught, but we're not arguing with anybody that wants to teach seven, it's fine. But obviously it's not a hundred years. It's three and a half as far as we can see, but some people still believe seven, that's fine. But we believe that that seven years began actually over here with Jesus Christ when he was baptized. Three and a half years later, it ended at his crucif, or it was paused. It was, you know... You know, time out kind of a thing at the cross, time out. And then when we get out of here, the Lord just hits the clock again. Okay, time in. Here we go. We're going to finish over here what he started over there. All right. And we've taught this many, many times why those two things right there are very, very similar. Son of perdition over here, son of perdition here. You know, the law in effect over here and the temple erected over here, law in effect, temple erected, so on and so forth. Moses and Elijah appear over here. Moses and Elijah appear over here. There's about 30 things that are similar between those two weeks. So if you just took this piece out of the story and pushed those two things together, you have a seven-year period, Daniel's 70th week, that makes one continuous story. But the end, as Paul refers to it, is our end, the end of this church age. And our hope is that, and we talked about this, we won't go back over the notes, but last week we talked about our hope, all right, which is the blessed hope of Titus chapter 2, the hope of glory, according to Romans chapter 5, Colossians chapter 1, the hope that one day when we see Jesus Christ, we will be like him, right? 1 John chapter 3, every man that hath this hope purifieth himself. What's our hope? That when Jesus Christ comes, praise the Lord, we're getting rid of this. This stinking rotten flesh that got you in so much trouble. Probably got you in trouble today. Right? You know, attitudes that stink, selfishness, all the kind of stuff, you know, that uh, Christians sometimes think as long as they're not committing adultery, they're okay. No. There's a whole lot of things in that book that God despises when he sees it in one of his children. And you and I have probably given him several reasons today to be upset with us. But praise God, one of these days, pretty soon, we're going to get rid of this flesh. We're going to be in a body like unto His glorious body. We're going to be made like Him, right? Like Him. That's our hope. So when the Bible speaks about hope, you've got to figure out what group is God talking to? Whose end is He referring to? And whose hope? And what hope is He talking about? So in this passage, in Hebrews 6... Since it's a book to the Hebrews, which end do you think he would be referring to? Which hope do you think he would be referring to? It's not a letter to the churches, but a letter to the Hebrews. Do you think in Hebrews chapter 6 he's referring to this? Can't be. And he's, he's not referring to the rapture. He's not referring to the end of the church age. Because the Hebrews have more history to come after the rapture. They still, as a nation, are not yet saved until the very end over here when they see Jesus Christ coming in glory from heaven. 
So when Hebrews speaks about the end, and Hebrews speaks about a hope, and the full assurance of hope, hanging on to that hope until the very end, well then it must be, or at least grant that it could possibly be talking about something other than the rapture, and something other than the end of the church age. All right? that's, the, that's the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. Now we've already looked at how what the end of the church is and what the hope of, the, of our of believers are, but we're talking about the end as it pertains to the nation of Israel. Just real quick, I know we looked at these two verses last week, but just go back. Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verse number, uh, verse number 5. Hebrews 3, verse 5. And Moses was verily, uh, was verily, verily was faithful in his, all his house as a servant. House there doesn't mean his, just his family. But in, in the Old Testament, a house would like the house of David. Would be all of those of David's lineage. And sometimes a house had to do with everything that was under the authority of a steward. A steward in the, in the Old Testament was someone entrusted with the management of a household. Right? That was a steward. Kings had stewards. Right? The king was busy with whatever he's busy with, and he entrusts the care of his family, the protection of his assets, you know, the, e the economy, everything, the care of his house, all those little things that maybe are not that important for him to be dealing with, but somebody is put in charge of those things. And in the Old Testament, there were many men who were faithful, faithful stewards. One of them is even a type of Christ in the Old Testament. We're not going to look at him right now, but stewards... Um, were responsible, they were given the responsibility for a house, in a sense. Moses, in a sense, was a steward. He was given responsibility for the nation of Israel in the wilderness. He was given responsibility to lead them out. Was he faithful? Yeah. He was faithful in all of his house. All the responsibilities given to him, he faithfully carried those things out like a good steward, given that responsibility. And it says here in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 5, that Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, a steward, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope Firm unto the end. Wow, very similar phrase to Hebrews 6.11. Hope unto the end. Hope unto the end. And here, somebody, it's conditional. Like someone is a part of that house. You're a member of that house, a part of that family in a sense. If, big word, right? If you hold fast that hope unto the end. Well, you and I, don't, that doesn't apply to me and you. You're not a member of the body of Christ only if you hold fast your hope unto the end. Now, there are some days you may give up hope. Guess what? You're still saved. There may be days when you throw your Bible away. Say, I quit. I can't do this anymore. Guess what? You're still saved. I mean, you might get a spanking because the Lord does chasten his own children, but you're not thrown out of the family because of your unfaithfulness because you didn't get into the family by your faithfulness. So your faithfulness didn't get you in, and your unfaithfulness can't get you out. It's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ that got us in. We put our faith in Him. He'll never fail. He'll never let us down. And He said, I will in no wise cast you out. So He doesn't ever throw anybody out if you're saved. But So your, your membership, let's say, in this house being spoken of here in Hebrews chapter 3, you and that's not our house, that's not the body of Christ, that's not the church. Because your faithfulness to hold on to anything does not keep you in the body of Christ. The Spirit of God keeps you in the body of Christ. So there again is a very similar expression, right? In verse number 5 there. It says, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? All right, look at verse number uh, 14, same chapter. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, same like as the word hope, confidence, hope. We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Very, so you got three expressions in Hebrews that are almost identical. 
right? Full assurance of hope unto the end. Holding fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. And again, hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Three times. Talking about holding on to hope or confidence unto the very end. Well, you and I do not have to do that in order to be part of Christ. So that's not directly applicable to us. But to the Hebrews it is. Because they will, they will be required to do that. But notice it says the end. All right, so, so they've got to hold on to something to the end. To the end of what? What do they got to hold on to until the end? Well, as a nation, they've got to hold on to that all the way over to the end. To the end, right here's the end for them. The end is right here. Let's look at some other verses. Um, we already looked at Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. It says, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Jesus said that. What does that mean? Hang on, be faithful to the end of your life, and then you'll be saved? Well, that's not the gospel that Paul preached. That's not the gospel we preach. Hang on until the end of your life, and then you're saved? That's not, that's not sound doctrine for us, but it's doctrine for somebody. If it's not doctrine for me and you, who is it doctrine for? The Hebrew people. That they were also the object of the book of Matthew as well. And also in Matthew, Matthew chapter 24, he said it, very, very similar expression. The he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved. The same shall be saved, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. And this gospel of the kingdom, that's another clue that it doesn't pertain to the church, because we do not preach the gospel of the kingdom. We preach the gospel of the grace of God. What's the good news? God is gracious. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, He will give you grace to be saved. For by grace are you saved, through faith and that not of yourselves. Our gospel message is about the grace of God, not about the kingdom. All right, so that, but, but the Lord said in Matthew chapter 24, The gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the earth, and then shall the end come. What's He talking about? Well, remember, if we take this out, because this was not a definite. When Jesus said those words over here, you have to see this. You have to understand this. When Jesus said what he said, he was right here. This was not for sure. This only happened because Israel rejected Jesus Christ. What if Israel had received Jesus Christ? The Lord said that if they would, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God were at hand. It was very near. He promised them the kingdom. They just had to receive him as their king. Had they done that, the story would be very different. I don't even know how the story would have unfolded. We don't know. This is the way it unfolded because of Israel's rejection. But if Israel had not rejected Jesus Christ, this would have continued right into that. This wouldn't have been here. This is like, we say this just to help everybody understand, because it helps me understand it. You know, parentheses are, right? In the middle of a sentence, you can have a parenthetical statement. And whatever's inside that parentheses is usually a complete thought, or it's something that you could take out. You could take that parenthetical thing out of the sentence completely, and what came before it and what comes after it makes complete sense. The rest of the sentence does not depend upon the parenthetical statement. It's just like added in. It's a, not an afterthought, but it's something extra added to the sentence that's not, the sentence doesn't need it. It's just put in there. But if you take it out, the sentence still makes sense. What came before and what's after, you could just push it together and it's one complete sentence. That's the church age. In fact, Paul, the apostle to the church, the first time his name shows up in the Bible, it's in parentheses. What a quinky dink, right? How the Lord did that. So this may not have happened at all. Thank God the Lord allowed this to happen. So you and I had a way of getting in just by the grace of God, right? And, but this is coming to an end, and our end is near. We're, we're leaving. We're leaving. And our hope is that we'll be, one day we'll be just like Jesus Christ. And so then after our departure, the story reverts back to what the Lord was doing over here. His focus over here was on Israel. His focus over here is Israel. Over here, he told his disciples not even to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. He said, go not in the way, go not in the way of the Samaritans, go not in the way of the Gentiles. When Jesus was <laughs> confronted by a Gentile woman who said, 
Master, please come and heal my daughter. Jesus said to her, It is not meat to give the children's food to the dogs. My goodness. If that lady had been from New York, she probably would have slapped him. <laughs> but you know what she said? There you go. She said, truth, Lord. <laughs> wow, I don't know what she understood. She understood something. There you go. She said, truth, Lord. But even the dogs get the crumbs off the master's table. And Jesus said, oh, woman, yes. oh, woman, great is your faith. And he healed her daughter anyway. He wasn't coming for the Gentiles then. It wasn't time for us to get the gospel. He was trying to win Israel. And when he was here, he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right? That's what he said over and over again. Told his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles. He avoided the Gentiles. But when Israel refused him, rejected him, reviled him, crucified him, even after that, the gospel still went to the Jews first. But then every time Paul took the gospel to a different city, the Jews would chase him out of town or persecute him until eventually in Acts chapter 28, he says, I turn to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And they did, and we have. And so, but this is temporary. This is coming to an end. And when this is gone, this is continued over here. And this never came to an end. This was not a conclusion. This was no conclusion at the end of the Lord's earthly ministry. It was the, it was the halftime, let's say. The whistle blew. It was halftime. We've been in halftime for 2,000 years. What a show, right? This has been some halftime show. And the halftime is almost over. And now the game is starting to pick up again. Once halftime has ended, all the people on the, on the field leave the field, and the players that were out there before halftime come back and pick up where they left off. And that's what's about to happen. This has been a 2,000-year halftime, and it's almost over. And as soon as it reverts to the, God's original program with the Hebrew people, they are going to need the book of Hebrews like you and I needed the book of John. And so here it's telling them to hold fast their full assurance of their hope unto the end. So their end is not the rapture. Their end is the revelation. Right? The revelation. Here, Jesus Christ is not revealed to the earth. In fact, the Bible doesn't even indicate he ever comes to the earth at the rapture. Because we meet him where? In the air. He stops in the air. He never comes to the earth. He stops in the air and calls us out. He never comes to the earth. So he's not being revealed to the earth. But his second advent here is called the revelation. Meaning he is revealing himself. The Bible says every eye shall see him. Over here, I don't know who's going to see him. Maybe, I don't know. You and I are going to see him, of course, but I don't know that our neighbors are going to see him. They may just look around and you and I are either, maybe they're going to see us ascending up into heaven or maybe look around and we're not there anymore. I don't know. But it, it, not everybody's going to understand what happened. Not everybody's going to see what happened because the Bible even says that the Antichrist is going to cause people in the tribulation to believe a lie. What's that lie? Probably the explanation of our disappearance. A, they were all right-wing Republicans, and we finally took care of them. They're all in concentration camps out in Arizona, so don't worry. They're not going to be a problem anymore. They're going to have to have some way of explaining how come you're not home. Why aren't you home? Where'd you go? Why didn't you show up at work? There's got to be something. And I don't know what the explanation is going to be, but it'll be something, and the whole world's going to believe it. They're going to go, oh, that's, oh, that makes sense. That's perfect. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to believe it. All right, so, so our end, we've come to our end, and we're in the presence of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We have, we're like Him, finally, at the judgment seat of Christ. We get bodies like Him, and we get ready while we're up here somewhere, up in heaven. It's up there somewhere right there. We're just getting ready, learning how to ride a horse, and then you get ready to come down right there. Revelation chapter 19. You're coming back with Jesus Christ. 
That is the revelation. Go to 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 13. Now, this also is part of the Hebrew epistles, the letters to the Jewish people. All right, notice it says in verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end. Wow. Somebody read Hebrews, I think, who wrote this. <laughs> Somebody was very familiar with Hebrews when they wrote this. Hope to the end. What for? Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think about that. Somebody has to hold on to hope unto the very end of something because at the end of that something, grace is going to be brought unto them and it tells you when that event is. The revelation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus is revealed to the earth. That ain't here. That's here. That means something is, some grace is poured out upon the Hebrew people when Jesus Christ returns. Let's go, let's go look at that just for a second if we could. Go with me to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Real fast. <clears throat> Look at verse number 9, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day. Hmm, what day would that be? Well, you read the rest of the chapter, it's talking about the revelation of Jesus Christ, when He comes in His glory. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. When does that happen? Right there. Right there, because that period ends with the war, the... Battle of Armageddon, all the nations under the Antichrist are going to try to destroy Israel, trying to destroy Jerusalem. And the Lord said, I will seek to destroy all those nations that come against, that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace hmm. and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Wow. They're going to see Jesus Christ. And when they see Him, the Lord is going to pour out the Spirit of grace upon them. What is grace? It's the opposite of what you deserve. Amen? What you deserve is not grace. What I deserve is not grace. I deserve judgment. It's what I deserve. I don't have any claim on grace. You don't either. Grace means undeserved favor. That's grace. Undeserved. The favor of God. Not because you're a good boy. It's just because God is good. Grace means God just pours out His favor, mercy, kindness, love, salvation on the undeserving. Now, I don't want to say if there was ever anybody undeserving, it would be the Jewish people. Because all I have to do is just look in the mirror. Amen. But as a people, as a nation, as a race, they have been bitter against the gospel and against Jesus Christ for all of this time right here. They have not been friends of God, friends of the gospel. Just stand up and preach in downtown Jerusalem and see what happens. I mean, there's not a, there's, there's not, a, even though it's a democratic country, <laughs> There doesn't seem to be a democracy when it comes to the preaching of the gospel. There's a lot of animosity toward Jesus Christ and toward the gospel. And we could say, wow, the Lord has really been long-suffering with them for 2,000 years. Yeah, He has, but, but I'm just as bad. He's been, you know, I, I shouldn't look down on the Jewish people. Oh, I should just look in the mirror and just be thankful that God is just who He is. God is just who He is. But who He is... In that day, even though by this time they will have done enough for him just to wipe them out. It's like Moses when the children of Israel at the, in Mount Sinai, when they were, 
Moses came down from the mountain and the children of Israel were dancing around. They were all naked and they're dancing and worshiping this golden calf. And, God, and Moses went to God and said, God, just wipe them out. Let's start over. God says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And uh, there's been a hundred times God should have wiped me out. But he, I don't know, he's just good. He's just good, he's long-suffering, he's so kind. And he's going to be that way with an entire nation of people, undeserving. But what happens at that revelation? What happens at his advent, second advent? He pours out grace. And instead of judgment, instead of punishment, instead of death, they receive life. They look on him whom they pierced. And the Bible says, and they shall mourn for him, as, as for a first begotten, you know, like losing your firstborn child. They're going to weep and wail and mourn, not out of fear, like, oh, don't hurt us. But it's going to grace and opens their mind. Grace opens their heart. Grace gives them understanding. They look upon that one. They're going to see those prints in his, in his hands and those, those wounds in him. And it's all going to click. Remember the day it clicked for you? Yes, <laughs> I mean, I remember the day it clicked for me. I heard the gospel for 22 or almost 23 years, and it didn't click. It just wasn't important. I didn't need it. I didn't need God. I didn't need anything. And then one day, it clicked. It made sense. My eyes were opened. Who, who's, who, how do you account for that? Intelligence? No. <laughs> Grace. <laughs> how do you account? You know, that song, Amazing Grace? How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to what? Fear. fear. And grace, my fears, relieved. Grace does it all. Grace helps you see you're on your way to hell. You need to be saved. That's a fearful realization, but it's grace that helps us to get a hold of that. We couldn't understand that. We couldn't connect the dots with a magic marker. We, we would not be able to do that. The Spirit of God connects the dots for us. And then shows you the danger you're in as a sinner. Grace taught my heart to fear, but then the grace of God relieved my fears by just pointing me to the cross and showing me, all right, yeah, it's true. You deserve to die. I should throw you in hell right now. But just look over here. There's the bleeding lamb. I'm willing to accept his death, his wounds, his blood as a payment for your sin. Will you take that deal? I said, I will. I said, I will. What, what, what enables you to do that? Grace. Grace does that. And what happens when Jesus is revealed to the nation of Israel? His grace is poured out on them. What happens? Their eyes are opened. Their heart finally, after all these thousands of years of stubbornness, blindness, their heart is going to melt. They're going to realize what they've done. They're going to look on the one whom they pierced, and they will mourn. That's repentance. That's sorrow. That's grieving. The Lord saves you when you're in that condition. The Lord doesn't save you until you mourn and grieve and are, and are repentant. No one would call upon the Lord unless they realized, oh, I'm in trouble. I better do this, or else it's going to be bad for me. And, and that's what the Lord is going to do here. But notice... It says that this grace, see the verse again, verse 13? When is this grace brought to them? When, verse 13? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is not here. That is here. When Jesus is revealed, that grace is poured out, what must they do until then? Hope unto the end. Hope unto the end. Hang on. Hold on to the very end. Endure to the end. And they'll be saved. That's what, the, that's what the scriptures make very, very clear. All right, go with me to, um, uh, let's see, go with me to Daniel. Let's go to Daniel for a minute. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel and the book of Revelation go together. You can't really understand one without the other. They are simpatico. They interpret each other. Daniel says things that will just make you scratch your head, and you go to Revelation, and it makes some sense. Revelation the same way, so you, you kind of read them together and, and try to interpret them together. And Daniel, although Daniel lived hundreds of thousands of years ago, he was given a vision of the future, 
And it was Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 that actually told us about this right here. This is called, see what it says right there? Daniel's 70th week. That's what we call it. Why? Because it's Daniel that told us about that. It's Daniel that told us that seven years, the last seven years of Israel's history, just before God established the millennial kingdom, that last seven years, and sevens in the Bible are a week. So seven days, seven months, seven years. That last seven years of Israel's history was Daniel's last week, final week. He, ta he talked about these weeks. And the last week is described in Daniel chapter 9. And at the end of that week is the kingdom. But Daniel chapter 9 says that in the midst of that week, the Messiah would be cut off. Huh. So in the middle of the week, something drastic was going to happen. And then at the end of that week, so when Daniel is talking about the end, he's not talking about the church. Daniel didn't even see this. None of the Old Testament prophets foresaw the church. They didn't see it. They didn't talk about it. It's like you're non-existent in the Old Testament. How come nobody in the Old Testament talks about us? Because God had not revealed it to the Old Testament prophets. Not Isaiah, Jeremiah, not Daniel, no one. All they saw were the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Here were the sufferings, here's the glory. That's all the Old Testament prophets saw. They did not see this. It was not time for them to understand that. That was revealed to Paul the Apostle. So Daniel, when Daniel is talking <clears throat> about the end, I wish I had a way to just draw this and take out the middle part and just squish, squish those two together. When Daniel is talking about the end, he's talking about this and this, without this. So the end would be the last seven years of Israel's history. That's why in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 26, says that Jesus was crucified once in the end of the world. What? Jesus was crucified in the end of the world? That verse makes no sense unless it's understood from a Jewish perspective. Take the church out of the picture, and then those two periods become the end of the world. All right, so when Daniel speaks about the end, he's not talking about the rapture. He's talking about the end for the Hebrew people. Look at it here in Daniel chapter 8. And he, he mentions the end about ten times in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> Always very, very consistent as to what it means. Daniel chapter 8, verse number 17, for example. <clears throat> he sees this vision. I'm not going to go into the whole detail here. I just want you to see the expression. He sees a vision. He comes near. This man comes near to where Daniel was standing. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, O oh, understand, O oh, son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Daniel is being shown a vision. He doesn't know what it means. It's a horrible thing that he's seeing. Is this something that's going to happen next week, next month? What are you showing me here, God? And he, and he was trembling at this, what, he, what was being revealed to him. So God sends an angel to speak to him and explain to him, comfort him, that this vision is not for now, Daniel. This, look at verse 17 again. For at the time of the end shall be the vision. So whatever it was that Daniel saw, these beasts that are rising up out of the earth, this fourth beast whose teeth were terrible, and, 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 it, and the, it, he saw the Antichrist on the earth. Daniel is where we get the understanding of the Antichrist. He's mentioned all through here. <clears throat> so, but what, what, does this, what was Daniel seeing? He was seeing something that pertains to the end. Not the end of the church, but Israel's end. All right, look at, verse number, um, uh, look at verse number 19. And he said, Behold, <clears throat> I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. Indignation in the Bible is a very specific word. It doesn't just mean that God is indignant. But in many times in the Bible, just Google, I mean, not Google, but whatever that, you know, like uh, when you look at things up, what is it, just search in your Bible program, just put in that phrase, the indignation. And you'll see it comes up in Isaiah many times, comes up in the other prophets. It's speaking about the tribulation. 
God looks upon what takes place on this earth in the tribulation, and he calls that the indignation, that some man would set himself up as God. God is very indignant about that. That is the indignation, and he pours his wrath out upon that. So the indignation is something very specific. Daniel refers to it several times. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Now the big prophecy about Daniel's 70th week is found from verses 24 to 27. We're not going to look at that right now, except to look at one little phrase in there. You can read it for yourself, mark it if you're not familiar with it. Verse 24 to verse 27 has been called, and I believe it's true, the greatest prophecy in the Bible. I think it's the greatest prophecy in all of the scriptures because it prophesies the birth of Christ, the timing of the birth of Christ, the events of the last seven years of Israel's history, of everything that's leading into the millennial kingdom. It predicts how it's going to end. Look at verse number 26, for example. It says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Hmm. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. This had both a near fulfillment in the days of, of uh, Titus, 70 A.D., but it has a future fulfillment in the days of the tribulation. We're not looking at that right now. And the end, the end thereof, the end, talking about the end of this 70 weeks, this 70th week, all right, this, this period right here, how does it end? It says in verse 26, the end thereof shall be with a flood. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined. The end shall be with a flood. A flood? Right here? Really? Remember like a flood like in the days of Noah? Like where God flooded the world with water? No, not like that. But any kind of judgment from God that comes in like a rushing flood that overwhelms you, buries you, submerges you, in the scriptures is called a flood. Nahum chapter 1, verse 8, for example. Go to Nahum chapter 1. <clears throat> Nahum, see if you can find that. First to find it, just wave your hand. Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. That's the only way I can find it. I've got to say it in my head. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. <laughs> Nahum. All right, anybody get it yet? You're still turning? Oh, look at this. Wow, what a good class. All right. Nahum, chapter 1. All right, look at verse number um, 6. <laughs> Who can stand before his indignation? God's indignation. Does God get indignant? Oh, yeah. Your sin makes him indignant. But then when this world joins hand together, hand in hand, and they, they're going to defy God, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. But God's indignant that men would think that they could overthrow him, that they could resist him, that they could defy him. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. Interesting phrase. The tribulation is called Jacob's, the time of Jacob's what? Trouble. All right. And what is the Lord like in the day of trouble? A refuge, safety. He knoweth them that trust him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. So the tribulation ends with a flood. We don't have to turn there, but if you turn to Revelation chapter 12, I forget what verses it is. I think it's, I don't remember. Verse 13 and maybe verse 19. It says that uh, Satan goes to persecute the nation of Israel. And out of his mouth goes a flood, right? That he can potentially destroy the nation of Israel. And somewhere in there, I think it's verse number 19, it says the earth helped Israel, helped her, helped the woman, and it opened up its mouth and swallows the flood. So the end of the tribulation comes with an attempt by the devil to destroy the nation of Israel, and this judgment, this horrible persecution, comes rushing like a flood would. You know, like a flat, anybody ever seen videos of flash floods on YouTube and things like that? I've seen a few where these guys, you know, people are just camping lazily you know, along the side of some river. They don't, and all of a sudden in the distance you hear this rumbling and roaring and all of a sudden it just seems like Niagara Falls is coming down the canyon at them. 
Flash floods come suddenly like that, overwhelm you, and there's no escape. You either got to get out of the way or you're dead. And so the judgment of God comes that way in the end. It's not like God knocking at your door. It's just sudden, boom, and it just carries everything before it. And so the end, you know, Daniel 9 says, shall be with a flood. Nahum says, the Lord, in the end, with an overrunning flood, is going to pursue his enemies, right? So the end, uh, the, what end is it talking about? All of them mention the end. The end shall be with a flood, and a flood at the end. When? The church age? No, no, no. They might not even know we're gone. I don't know. Life will probably just go on. The Lord himself is going to send them strong delusion that they're going to believe that lie. So they might not even miss us when we're gone. I don't know. But I'll tell you what. Nobody's going to miss what's going on over here. Because there's going to be a wrath and a judgment like a flood coming from God at the end. That's Israel's end. So when Hebrews is talking about the end, it's not talking about the rapture. It ain't talking about our end. It's talking about the way things end for the nation of Israel in that time. All right, let's, uh, we got to close here. Let me just see. Let's go. Uh, turn over with me to um, Daniel. I'm going to skip a couple of things here. Let's go to Daniel chapter 11. I'll just end on this point here. It's just two more verses. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11. Now in Daniel chapter 11, the identity of the Antichrist is revealed. Or at least we're given some details about who he is, where he comes from. Not enough for us to know his address and his name, but you know, there's an awful lot of information given about him in Daniel chapter 11 and in, in chapter 12. Uh, in Daniel chapter 11, for example, let's go down to verse number 35. It's talking about, And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge, make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And then starting in verse number 36, you have a big description of the Antichrist here. Here he's called the king of the north. And we won't get into that now, but from Israel's perspective, at the time this was written, she had an enemy to the north of her and an enemy to the south of her. The enemy to the north of her was Syria, or the Assyrian Empire. And it was governed by one of the generals uh, of Alexander the Great. It was Greek. It was a Greek empire. Even though it was Syria, it was Greek. And Syria, the area of Syria, the Middle East, Assyria was all Greek culture until more modern times because of the influence of Alexander the Great. And another one of Alexander's generals took Egypt. That's why Alexandria, Egypt, was a great, great, great city, a place of learning and Greek culture. So you had Greek culture to the north of Israel, Greek culture to the south of Israel, the king of the north and the king of the south are mentioned in the book of Daniel uh, prophetically because they warred back and forth with each other. Armies from the north went down to conquer the south. Armies from the south went up to conquer the north. Guess who's stuck in the middle? Israel. They, had, they got trampled on either way. Whatever army was coming from the north to go take, you know, fight I Egypt, Israel was in the way. They got, they got blasted. And when the king of the south went after the king of the north, Israel was in the way. They got blasted then also. Now, this is history. You can read about that in history. You don't even need your Bible. And all of that is verifiable. You can read even in a couple of the books of the Apocrypha. First and Second Maccabees describes all of that period of time. But Daniel spoke about it long before the Maccabees were even born. He was prophesying what was going to happen. And it turns out that the king of the north, in, in the book of Daniel, the Antichrist is called the king of the north. What is that? What in the world? Why, what would the king of the north from Syria or Assyria be associated with the king of the north, with the Antichrist? Well, in the book of Isaiah, the Antichrist is called the Assyrian. That's weird. The Antichrist is called the Assyrian. I don't know what that means because he's from Assyria or he's Syrian. I don't know what it means. But he's called the Assyrian in the book of Isaiah. And the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 11 comes from the north, north of Israel. The king of the north it was... Uh, the king of that part of the world. I forget his name. Um, what is this? Antiochus. Ant Antiochus. Antiochus. And one of them, I think he was the eighth, the eighth in a, in a lineage of kings of Syria, the eighth was Antiochus Epiphanes, who believed himself to be God. On his coins, he had, he had inscribed to himself as a deity. He was God. Like the Antichrist is going to, call himself God. And the 
little king of the north, Antiochus Epiphanes, is actually mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. And so what he does in history was a preview of what the Antichrist is going to do in the future. And so you see there's this, this uh, interplay between you know, the near future and the far future. But here you see, but I want you to see when Daniel gets to Daniel chapter 11, notice for, for verse 40, for example. And at the time of the end, what end is that? The end of the day, the end of your life? No, the end of Daniel's 70th week. The end right here, when things end, and the next is the kingdom, the eternal, the, the millennial kingdom. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, meaning the king of the north. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, etc., etc. And so you see this battle going on. When? At the time of the end. Jump over to chapter 12. <clears throat> and at that time, verse 1, shall Michael stand up. The great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. Michael the archangel is the protector of the nation of Israel. That's why the archangel comes down with Jesus Christ in our rapture. Do you ever think about that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Why is the archangel in the middle of my rapture? What's he got to do with us? He's for Israel. Well, because he's standing up because... As we're leaving, goodbye, something else is beginning over here, and Michael is responsible for that. He stands up in that day, in that last part of Daniel's 70th week, stands up for the children of thy people, <clears throat> and it goes on down through here. Look at verse number 4. But thou, O Daniel, Daniel could not understand what in the world does all this mean. And verse 4, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Wow, sounds like us today, right? Everybody running to and fro, cars, planes, trains, automobiles, everything, zip, 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 space, you know, flying everywhere. Knowledge? You and I have more information in that little phone that you have right there, and more computing power than they had in the first spaceships that they sent up around the Earth. That little phone you have is a, like, that has more power and information in it. We take it for granted, you know, kids just are given one, whatever, when they're three years old, it seems like today, and it's just like a third appendage, you know? Uh, and it's like, but like, I remember when I, I first found out why wow, you could just look up on the internet anything? Like anything? Do you remember when that was brand new? Do you remember the first time you heard the word Google and you're like, what? Goo, Google, God, Goo. what is that? And you just, Google it, and there's information. I remember the first thing I looked up. I remember the very first thing I looked. It was about coal mining in Pennsylvania. I don't know why. I just wanted to see if it was true. They said, oh, yeah, you can find anything. I right, come on. No, anything you want, just put it in there. It'll, it'll bring up information about it. Ah, right, come on. Really? I just said, all right, I just put in there, I don't know, coal mining or something in, in Pennsylvania. It's like, man. I could have been an expert on coal mining in Pennsylvania with all the information like there. The Bible says knowledge in the last days, when the end, knowledge shall increase. Now they're talking about hardwiring right into human bodies, machinery, graphene, which has the ability to be injected into your blood, and it's not even human, it's not, bi it's not, it's not biology, it's, it's a man-made substance, not man-made, but it's, it's a foreign substance that can take form and enhance people's bodies. So much crazy stuff is happening right now. You talk about knowledge increasing. It's increasing exponentially so fast. You and I can't keep up with it. You and I don't even know what's happening right now. You used to be able to buy an encyclopedia. It came in books and you kept it for 30 years, right? <laughs> now the information is, is obsolete the next week. They couldn't put it in a book. Because it's, it's already changed the following week. It's something new already. It's so... It's hap everything's happening so fast. Wow, Daniel saw that 3,000 years ago. God told him, in the end, they're going to run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, how did he know that was going to happen? God knew. God was telling him. When was this going to take place? The time of the end? That tells me we're living right in the end days, the last days. The last days for the church, which means after we're gone, it's only a few more years until the end for everything and everybody. The end for Israel. 
Look at verse number, um, look at verse number, okay, we're done here. Uh, I'm not going anywhere outside of Daniel chapter 12, I promise. Look at verse number um, 8. Daniel chapter 12, verse 8. And I heard, Daniel said, but I understood not. Don't worry, Daniel, neither do we. <laughs> then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now that tells me there's a lot about this book you and I are not going to get. We're not going to understand it. It's closed. God is not going to give us understanding until it's absolutely necessary right at the end. But things are opening up. We're starting to see some things. But God already said, just go your way, Daniel. Don't lose any sleep over this. I'm not going to reveal why, what and when and all this. Just write it down. It's sealed. Nobody can understand it until the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. I like that. That means there's some hope right here at the end. It's possible for us to get a handle on what's happening and for God to reveal it to us. That's what it says. The wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and fifty uh, five and thirty days. It's talking about the tribulation. Those are time periods in here. That's three and a half years if you add it up. <clears throat> But, verse 13, but go thy way till the end be. Hmm. For thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. That's why some people think that that angel, so to speak, that shows up in the book of Revelation is actually Daniel. Right? Because when John bows down to worship him, the angel, the angel says, get up off your feet. I'm just one of the prophets. Huh. An angel who's one of the prophets? God told Daniel, just go your way for now. You're going to stand again on the earth in the, in the end. So it could be Daniel that's revealing those things to, to John in the book of Revelation. Anyway, okay, so next week we're going to look at Israel's hope. What, what, what are they going to be waiting for? It says they've got to hold on to this hope. Well, what is it that, well, I know what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping, I know Jesus is going to come. That's our blessed hope. And that when he comes, we're going to be like him. When we see him, we're going to be like him. That's my hope. <clears throat> But what's Israel's hope? Are they waiting to be raptured out? No. They're not going anywhere. Their hope is not our hope. They're not waiting to be raptured. Are they waiting to get brand new bodies? Nope. No. No. They're waiting for something different. Their hope is different from our hope. So next Wednesday we will look at the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel. All right? Let's bow our heads. Thank you for your kind attention. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord God, we do thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, Lord God, for a book that does show us the future, helps us understand the crazy times we're living in, helps us to realize, Lord, that you wrote history in advance. Men are trying to figure it out, but you said from the very beginning, you told exactly the way things were going to unfold. It's an incredible thing, Lord, to realize that you see the future and know it and write all about it and tell us what's going to happen, and you control it. Lord, what a blessing that you would have us as your own, that you would save us and make us part of your family. And I thank you for that. It was a, brother t a blessing tonight to be able to pray beside my brother and just not really save that long, but what a blessing to know he's a brother in Christ tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us as a church to realize in the time that we have left, Lord, that help us to remember what's really important. Help us to get our priorities in the right place. Help us not to fret over the things that we can't change and uh, fret over the things that are changing all around us. Lord, uh, we despair sometimes, Lord. We are amazed at how wicked and how quickly everything is falling apart. And yet, Lord, your word said these things were going to happen and we shouldn't be amazed at it. So I pray you'd give us wisdom, give us comfort. Help us also, Lord to hold fast to that hope you've given us, that blessed hope of your coming and of our gathering together unto you. Lord, it couldn't come soon enough. But I pray until then you'd help us to be found faithful. Bless your people tonight as everybody goes home. We pray you'd get everybody home safely tonight. And we pray that you prepare us, Lord, as a church for Sunday morning. What a blessing to be able to see new believers who are willing to publicly acknowledge that and stand before their church. And, uh, and be baptized. And I pray you'll bless them. Pray for their families that may come to see that who aren't saved. We pray that you do a work in their hearts. 
And uh, may your will be done. Thank you for our people, Lord. We just pray that you'll use us this week for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. What you're reading here, you're going to see it happen in front of your eyes. You're going to see it happen.